sometimes when we read the Bible, we find that the men of God were given a message by God that the men of God that were given the message knew before they took the message to the crowd they were going to preach to or teach to that those people would not accept the message. Jesus had that message. Most people in Jesus' day did not accept the message of salvation that He had. I'm thinking about Isaiah. When God commissioned Isaiah to go preach to the uh, the house of Israel, God actually told Isaiah, Isaiah, I want you to go talk to these people, but Isaiah, before I send you, by the way, it, when you go and give them the words I've given you, they're not going to listen to you because I've hardened their ears and I've blinded their eyes, Isaiah. But nevertheless, I want you to go. Now that sounds pretty foolish, don't it? It's talking about a message that the majority of people would not accept. How about Noah in his day? Noah preached for 120 years and the Bible tells us how many people got saved. Noah and his household. Eight people out of the whole world accepted Noah's message. So when we read the Bible, we will find that when a man of God is given a message, he is, he is presented in a dilemma. Especially in Isaiah's case, when God tells him beforehand... You're going to go preach to them, but they're not going to accept what you've got to say. Jeremiah, his message was so rejected that they got so mad that they threw him in a dungeon. What about that? He was called the weeping prophet, and literally no one accepted Jeremiah's message. We read about Jesus, we read about Paul when they preached the cities they went in and the crowds they went to it always called, caused controversy in the crowds that they preached to. So the man of God more than not is, is going to cause controversy with the message that he has. I say that and I give that introduction because of the message that we're going to talk about today, the title of the message. I've titled this study Ecumenism and if you don't know what that is you, you'll know by the time we're through. Ecumenism. E-C-U-M-E-N-I-S-M. -E Ecumenism. Easy Believism and Billy Graham. Now when I say that name I know that the tensions are getting high already. Because we know we're going to be, the teacher is going to be saying something about Billy Graham that you may not have heard before. Now, when I say the word Billy Graham, we all get the same visual mental picture in our minds, don't we? We get the idea of these hundreds of thousands of people in a crowd. We see this charismatic guy up on a stage preaching. And then what do we see? We see thousands of people coming down out of the crowd and after the preaching and the invitation is given and we see that. We see that, we've seen that over and over again for since the 19. 49 was Billy Graham's first crusade in Los Angeles. So for decades and years, that's the image that we've seen. So what we've done is we have in our minds, we have seen all these people supposedly get saved at a Billy Graham crusade and we have concluded what a great man of God. And that's true. Billy Graham is, was and is a great man of God. One of the greatest that's ever lived. Billy Graham was presented opportunities as a man of God that literally hardly anyone on earth has ever been presented. He met with presidents. He met with leaders of all kinds of states. And 
Before we get started in the study, I want to say what the study is not, and I want to say what it is, okay, so that I can clarify some things. What this study today is not is a Bible teacher such as myself attacking Billy Graham personally. That's what it's not, okay? It's not that. This study today is not somebody that's just taking a swipe at a man that's passed away. That's not what it is. This is not a study of someone that is envious or jealous of another preacher or teacher. That's not what it is today. What this study is, is an expose about two areas of what I believe is error in the life of Billy Graham during his crusades. And those areas have already been mentioned in the title, Ecumenism and Easy Believism. So that's what it is. It's not about the man. When one person attacks another person personally, that's unbiblical to do that. That's called ad hominem. And some of us in here have probably experienced being personally attacked by someone verbally. It's not a good feeling, is it? Now, what this Bible teacher is talking about today is not something new, okay? This has been known about Billy Graham as long as he's been preaching the evangelical crusades. There are people that have known about Billy Graham's ecumenism and his easy believism. So this, what we're talking about is not something that's new. It's been known for decades. Now, let me say this. While we're talking about Billy Graham in this study... This also applies to any preacher or teacher on earth today that subscribes to ecumenism or easy believism. It's not limited only to Billy Graham. If I all of a sudden embraced ecumenism or easy believism, these things that we're going to talk about would apply to me also. Okay? Okay, now that we've had the introduction and we've said what the study is not about, a personal attack on a man, but what it is about, an area of two areas that I believe and a lot of other people believe Billy Graham erred in, which is ecumenism and easy believism. Now that we know what the study is about, and now that nobody has left the building, thank you all for staying <laughs> in this uncomfortable study and atmosphere. I appreciate it. Let's define what easy believism and ecumenism is. First of all, let's define what ecumenism is. Ecumenism at its basic definition is a unity movement. It's trying to get everybody unified. Now, when we talk about religious ecumenism, Lord, I can't say that word. Y'all pray for me. Ecumenism, I have defined it as a satanic unity movement that masquerades as a genuine movement of God. Okay? Now, I've defined easy believism as this, a salvation technique, that's the key word, technique, how we get people saved, that has as its primary goal producing numbers of converts instead of having as its primary goal producing genuine converts. Now, it was known... One of the goals of the Billy Graham Evangelical Crusades right from the very beginning, they said our goal is to fill church buildings full of new converts. And they did that. 
But before we go any farther, let's ask a question and let's answer it from the Bible. Is it possible for someone that is following Christ to have good intentions, but those good intentions be satanic in origin? What do you think the answer to that question is? Just because someone has good intentions, does that mean it's from God? Not necessarily, does it? Let's go to the Bible and answer that question. Mark 8.33, here's what it says. We're talking about Peter, the problem child, like us. You ever feel like Peter? Oh, I do. Mark 8.33 says this. Now, Jesus just started talking about having to go die and be crucified and be handed into evil men. And here's what Peter did in verse 32. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, verse... Uh, yeah, right here, verse 32. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Peter dragged Jesus over to the side and began to rebuke Jesus. Peter was literally saying, what are you talking about, Jesus? You're talking crazy. You're not supposed to die. I've read the Old Testament. You're supposed to be the Messiah. You're supposed to set up your kingdom. Now, Jesus' response to Peter at this moment is very interesting. Notice what Jesus' reply was. In verse uh, 33, But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus called one of his disciples Satan. You know what that was saying? Peter, you have good intentions right now. You don't want me to suffer. But you don't know it, Peter. But you're under the influence of Satan right now and don't even know it, Peter. That's what Jesus was literally telling Peter. So Peter was was attempting to bypass the cross. If Jesus would have listened to Peter here, Jesus would have immediately set up His kingdom. There would have been no cross. There would have been no salvation. And Satan would have got to send everyone to hell. So do you see how why Jesus said what He said? Peter was allowing himself using thinking he had good intentions, allowing himself to be used by Satan. Now, I say that any preacher or teacher on earth today, including myself, that would subscribe to the unbiblical doctrines of ecumenism or easy believism is doing the same. No one is exempt. Preacher Billy Graham is not exempt from that as great a preacher as he was. Nobody is exempt. Paul took Peter. In other words, no one is above accepting error. Some of the greatest men we've ever known have went into error. Remember Jimmy Swagger? Anybody? He went into error. There's People we can think of, congregations in Kingsport, their pastors went into error, but instead of the congregations rebuking them, they allowed them to continue. I'm sure you know the story I'm talking about. So we have a choice when great men of God, well-known men of God, or unknown men of God go into error. We have a choice that we must make. We can let it slide or we can expose it. That's the purpose of this today. To show that while Billy Graham at his crusades brought many people to the Lord, to salvation, Billy Graham behind the scenes accepted and was a promoter of modern ecumenism. And 
the way that people were saved at the Crusades, the, the easy believism, there were actually more that were not saved than was saved. The statistics are this. From the own people that have had the Crusades throughout the years, their own statistics say that up to 80% of the people that come forward at crusades actually do not get saved. So the failure rate at a modern evangelical crusade, not just Billy Graham's, anyone's, the failure of salvation rate is up to 80%. Now, let me ask you a question at this point. If at the job you work at, if you failed at that job 80% of the time, would you remain at that job or not? You would not remain there. If a company had a failure rate of 80% with its products, what would happen to the company? It would go out of business. And rightly so. But incredibly in America, with modern evangelical crusades, we have accepted an 80% failure rate when it comes to getting souls saved. Now, let me say this. You may have not even known the statistics until now. I didn't know until I started studying it. But let me say this. The people that hold the Crusades know these statistics. They're the ones that came up with the statistics. So they are continuing something that fails even though it has failed. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about easy believism a little bit. Easy believism is the technique driven from a mindset. The underlying mindset is we want numbers. We want numbers. We're into the numbers. If you, if you look at, if you've watched a crusade and you have, I have, you have, it's always in a controlled setting. There's a charismatic present her on stage at the end of the message there is a highly emotional that's a key word highly emotional atmosphere created the music starts playing the invitation is given and let me ask you a question when you are in a highly emotional state or an elevated emotional state what kind of decision are you likely to make at that moment? An irrational decision. People that are people that are tore up emotionally or elevated emotionally, the likelihood of them making a rational decision goes way down. Let me give an example. Let's forget about the Crusades for a moment and let's bring it home to where we are. And I've experienced this, maybe you have. You're at a funeral. There's been a hellfire and brimstone message. Amen to that. Good. But after the funeral, when, when there's an altar call given and the preacher says, if you want to see Granny again, come up here to this altar. It's presented that if you want to go to heaven and see granny, come and get saved. Now folks, let me ask you a question. Is that a biblical reason to be saved, to go see grandma? No, it's not, is it? The chances are when a preacher says that to lost people, he is going to create an elevated emotional state in the people that are listening to his voice. I even heard one preacher one time about a man that rode his four-wheeler and drunk beer all his life. Here's what I heard the preacher say. He's probably up in heaven right now riding a four-wheeler with Jesus. 
Now that presented an antinomian atmosphere. Just anybody can go to heaven. That's what that preacher did. So do you see how in the, in the modern evangelical crusade there is an intentional setting that's created that makes it more likely to have people come down the aisle. Now, when you think about crusades, there have been some key phrases that were uh, popularized, I would say, by Reverend Dr. Billy Graham. And these two phrases are, make a decision for Christ. You would hear Billy Graham always say, will you make a decision for Christ? And another one is, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Now, if you would look in the Bible at examples of lost people being saved that way, you would look in vain because there's no example of a lost person inviting Jesus into the heart to be saved or a lost person making a decision for Christ. Now that, I believe, we have lowered the standard of salvation. In the world we live in, nobody demands that God is left out. The convicting spirit of God. The convicting power of God. So I believe that's what has been left out. And the desire of that came from wanting to wanting numbers of converts instead of genuine converts. So these were the phrases that were made popular at the evangelical crusades. So the results of that, the results of the methods that were used by Mr. Billy Graham and others have resulted in an up to 80% rate of people not being saved. Now here's, here's the problem with that. You may have not known this until now, But when somebody signed a, quote, decision card at a Billy Graham crusade, that's what you did after you supposedly got saved. You signed a decision card. And there were men that took those cards up. If you were a Catholic, if you were a professing Catholic at a Billy Graham crusade and you supposedly got saved... The decision cards were instructed by Billy Graham to be given to Roman Catholic bishops. So here's here's what I want to get the point. If you went, if you go to any evangelical crusade, including Billy Graham's, there's an 80% likelihood that you would have not really been saved, but would have thought you had got saved, okay? Do you see the danger in that? So you would have you would have been told that if you asked Jesus into your heart and you repeated a sinner's prayer and you signed the card, you are now saved. So there's a very high likelihood that you did not really get saved if you were a Catholic. At that point, while you you are thinking you're saved, you are then sent back to the Roman Catholic Church unconverted. Now when that happened, when you thought you got saved at a crusade, but in fact were not, And then you were sent back to the Roman Catholic Church, which is what Billy Graham directed his people to do. Their their phrase was, we don't want to proselytize anyone. So if you were at a Billy Graham crusade and you were a Jew that supposedly got saved, a Muslim that supposedly got saved, a Mormon, a Catholic, or a pagan, 
After you got saved, you were sent back to the same place you came from. That was at the direction of Mr. Billy Graham that came down from headquarters to do that. So when you were sent back to a Roman Catholic church that virtually ensured that you would die in a lost condition. Why do I say that? The Roman Catholic Church is a false church based on a false gospel. The gospel of Roman Catholicism is faith plus works. Some of those works involve baptism. You have to have baptism. You have to have mass to keep your salvation safe. And then, to make absolutely sure, somebody has to pray for you when you go in the grave. It's called purgatory to make sure that you go to heaven. So there's at least three things added to faith alone and Christ alone. Matter of fact, and Mr. Billy Graham should have known this, the, the official stance of the Roman Catholic Church is that they still adhere to the Council of Trent. That's a Roman Catholic document. In that document, there is a curse or an anathema that's pronounced on anyone that would be you and I, that would be Billy Graham that says that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, without any works, which is exactly what we say. We teach that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and you don't add any works to it. Roman Catholicism says that if you believe that, you are under the curse of God and you are under the Roman Catholic Church's curse. You're outside the church. By the way, the Roman Catholic Church has deemed itself to be the one and true body of Christ on earth today. They believe they are the only church, the one and only, and it's their job to get everybody else into the Catholic Church so that we can truly be saved. Now, is the ecumenical movement coming becoming more clear get everybody under the Catholic umbrella. Unfortunately, Reverend Dr. Billy Graham was instrumental in that effort. I hate to say that, but he was. So because of easy believism that was, that was presented at these crusades, it resulted probably and thousands and thousands of people believing they were saved and when they were sent back to those unchristian organizations like Mormonism, uh, Catholicism, it virtually ensured that they would die in a lost state. So do you see the dangers of easy believism in the world that we live in today? It's a watering down of the gospel. When you and I got saved, when we tell about our salvation experience, we talk about being under the conviction of sin. I was afraid to go to hell. If you go to an evangelical crusade and ask somebody what motivated them to get saved, the answer is not going to be, I was afraid to go to hell. It's not going to be that. Now, let's talk about ecumenism. We've talked about easy believism, and let's talk about ecumenism. So easy believism was the technique, which was a deliberate technique. By the way, it wasn't accidental. These were controlled environments at these evangelical crusades. They were in Billy Graham's day, and they continue to be in our day. It's a controlled environment. What else is in a controlled environment that you can think of. The, mir- the supposed miracle healings, aren't they? So. That could be in any service, Larry, I think. I yes. Be here or Absolutely. Get into the uh, affiliate instead of, uh, I mean, caught up with the yes. worship that's in yes, the yes. Building, 
Absolutely. It can be in any setting, and you're right. It's mimicked on a small scale level every Sunday in America. That easy believism, highly elevated emotional setting to try to get someone coerced into a a making a decision. I call it emotional coercion. Is what I call it. My daughter, the youth go to that power thing where they beat them blocks up and stuff. Yeah. She did that. Okay. For years. Mm-hmm. Really hadn't found the Lord, you know, and, and what? Now she's in a I church said, and praise uh, the Lord. But yeah, she really praise the Lord. Do you know what I'm happy about right now at this point, you all? I'm happy that everybody's still in the building with us right now. <laughs> Thank you all for staying and listening to this highly, highly controversial and difficult topic that we're talking about. But it's the truth. I would say one more thing. The people that are saved, and I didn't watch Brother Graham that night, mm-hmm. I respect it. The people that were saved in those truly, some of them may truly been saved. We yes. can't say that. Absolutely. We cannot say that they were not. Absolutely. Know? And those statistics are not always right. Right, right. I mean, you know, we just have to, like, yeah. we can't say, we don't have that right to say anybody's been saved. Or not. Amen, Only amen. Only that person. Right, right. Yeah. Even Billy Graham said that. The majority of them that came forward was not saved, but he said that they did make a decision mm-hmm. to to seek salvation. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. 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 That's why I said at the introduction what this is not about. It's not about saying that no one was ever saved under Billy Graham's preaching. That would be absolutely false, and I would have to answer to God for that one day, that it's not true. There were people saved under Billy Graham's preaching. He was greatly used by God, uh, was in different places, wrote books, and he was he was biblically correct a majority of his lifetime. But we're talking about two areas that he erred in, especially in the area of ecumenism, okay? So we're going to talk about that next. Um, We'll get started on it, but we'll probably have to finish this next part up next week, part two. We'll have to make a part two. uh, Too much stuff. But ecumenism, there is a motto of modern religious ecumenism, and it is this. That all may be one. But here's the problem of ecumenism and Billy Graham from his very earliest years. The evidence is going to show from his own words that he fully embraced the ecumenical movement. So that meant that Billy Graham fully embraced Catholics. The evidence is going to show that the people that Billy Graham was warned by conservative, his conservative pastor friends, you're going into error, Billy. And the evidence is going to show that Billy ignored them and went full on and fully embraced ecumenism. Now the result of that, in 1994, after four decades of Billy Graham embracing ecumenism, a document was signed in the America. Anybody know what it is? I'll give you the acronym ECT. Evangelicals and Catholics Together. And in that document, they basically said, why there's no difference in evangelicals and Catholics? There's no difference. The differences are minute. Meanwhile, the Council of Trent is still in effect and has never been nullified. They ignored all that. So the motto of ecumenism is that all may be one. That sounds noble, don't it? Why, that sounds... Let's get everybody together under a big tent. And the, 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 it sounds like a noble goal at face value, don't it? Like a, sort of like Peter believing taking the Lord aside and changing his mind sounded like a noble goal. But Jesus said, no, it's satanic in origin. The modern religious ecumenical movement is a ploy of Satan to bring about the one world church. It's going to happen 
It's prophesied in the Bible. The one world church. So the ecumenical movement is part of that plan and the document Evangelicals and Catholics Together is further promoting that. Preacher Dr. Billy Graham fully embraced the ecumenical movement from his very earliest years. We'll talk about that next week. Now the gospel, and in Billy Graham's own words, he said that the gospel I preach is inclusive. That sounds good at face value, don't it? So... This gives us a key into the mindset of Billy Graham and those that embrace the ecumenical movement. Let's just get everybody together under Christ and we'll all be one. That sounds wonderful, don't it? Well, let's look in the Bible and let's see if when Jesus talked about unity, if He was inclusive or exclusive. Does the gospel include everybody or does it exclude everybody unless you meet a condition? John 17, and we'll, we'll finish up after this one. We've got a few minutes. I'll just hit some highlights. John 17. We're asking the question... First of all, let's go to uh, um, right there, verse 21. This sounds almost like the motto of ecumenism. Verse 21, John 17, that they all may be one. So Jesus said that my true believers will be one. Okay? Now when Jesus said the true believers of His would be unified as one, was Jesus including everybody or was he just including certain people? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, John 17, verse 3 is the first clue that Jesus excluded people. Jesus only included the ones that were given unto him by the Father from the foundation of the world. Verse 2. As many as thou hast given him. So when Jesus talked about unity, he wasn't talking about Mormons, Catholics. He was talking about true believers. Verse 6, right there it is again. The men which thou gavest me out of the world. So Jesus didn't include the whole world in his prayer in John 17. He excluded everyone but the true believers. So there will only be true unity amongst true believers. There will never be a true unity when you include false believers. That's key. And matter of fact, at the, at the heading of my study, I wrote this. A unity that compromises the truth is a false unity. Think about that. Next week we will come back and we'll talk further about ecumenism and what I want to do so that you will have no doubt we're going to listen at some of Reverend Dr. Billy Graham's own words and we're going to see was Billy Graham an ecumenist or not. The evidence will show. So hopefully you'll come back next week.